Welcome to living life. When we watch movies or when we read stories, we always encounter conflict. And when we try to make sense of conflict, the first thing we do is figure out who is the hero that we're supposed to love and cheer for, and who is the villain that we're supposed to dislike and oppose. And that is how we make order, and that is how we align our hearts when we watch movies or when we read stories. And it's the same when we read the Bible. In order for us to make sense of the passage, in order for us to put our hearts into it, we have to know who is the hero and who is the villain. But the problem is, in Scripture, so often, every human being is flawed, everyone is a sinner, and there is no one to root for, except, of course, God. May it be as you look in today's uh, text and you see all of the conflict in the story, May it be that you're able to follow, uh, follow the story by identifying God as the hero and giving your love and your affection to Him. Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to do what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think is best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to shore. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from, and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now pregnant, and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me, for she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Barad. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. In today's story, we see three characters, three human characters. We have Sarah, Abraham, and Hagar. And they're all mad at each other, and they have reason to be frustrated with each other. Let's begin with Sarah. Sarah goes to Abraham and says, Hey, honey, I know you really want a son. And I know God promised you a son, and I don't think I can give a son to you. Why don't you take Hagar, my maidservant, sleep with her, and have a son that way? She was doing this probably as a test to see if Abraham really, really wanted a son more than being wholly devoted to her. And Abraham kind of fails the test, and he says, oh, that sounds like a good idea. If if you want to, I'll do it. And he um, lies with Hagar, and Hagar becomes pregnant. And at that time, uh, we see that Abraham and Sarah both treat Hagar as property, as uh, someone they don't consult, they don't ask Hagar's opinion at any point. They just do what they want with her. And of course, Hagar could feel oppressed by this situation. 
Um, so we can see that Hagar could be offended by Sarah and Abraham. Um, but we see in verse, uh, verse 4 that Hagar begins to be a sinner as well and begins to be hurt, hurting other people as well. It says that after Abraham slept with Hagar and she conceived, when she knew that she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. So instead of being loyal to Sarah, instead of honoring Sarah, she begins to say, you know, I'm replacing you, Sarah. I am the better woman. I am the most important female in this household. And I am the one that you should be serving. And she begins to exert her authority as the uh, sole mother to Abraham's, Abraham's child. And so in this situation, we see that Hagar is a victim, but she's also a victimizer. Sarah is a victim, but in her treatment of Hagar, she's also a victimizer. The same is true for Abraham. Uh, he's trying to make everyone happy, but he's a victim because um, Sarah blames Abraham for the way Hagar treats her. Um, you, you see in verse 5, where Sarah says, you are responsible for the wrong that I am suffering. And um, for that reason, uh, Abraham can feel like uh, you know, he's a victim, um, but he's also a victimizer because he immediately betrays Hagar and he says to her, your slave is in your hands. Do with her whatever you think is best. And then Sarah mistreats her and Hagar flees from her. So as we're getting towards uh, verse 6, what we see is that these three human characters are hurting each other. None of them is using their authority or their privilege in kind and compassionate ways. All of them are frustrated and all of them are hurting others around them. In this situation, who are we supposed to side with? Who do we love and root for? Who do we consider our hero? There is no one to look towards except in verse 7. We see the angel of the Lord who finds Hagar near a spring in the desert. This is um, the messenger of God who sees Hagar and who is kind and also who is wise towards Hagar. He said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? And over the course of this conversation, the angel of the Lord counsels Hagar to go back and serve Sarah. And this, in this way, um, the angel of the Lord um, helps to heal Sarah. But at the same time, the angel doesn't um, objectify Hagar. He really sees Hagar. And he gives mighty and strong promises to Hagar. And those things bring soothing to her soul so much so that she is able to praise God and say, you are the God that really knows me and cares for me. And we also see that in ordering this peace in Abraham's household, the angel of the Lord is truly kind unto Abraham, doing for him pretty much what Abraham should have been doing for himself, praying and seeking God's will and hoping to establish peace in the area in which he had authority. So we see that even though the people make a mess of things, the angel of the Lord shows up and by his authority and by his wisdom begins to make the decisions that we can cheer because it is kind to all and leads towards true shalom. In the story of our lives, we're often experiencing conflict. And in the midst of that conflict, we often assign blame because we're trying to assign roles. We're saying, I'm the hero, you're the villain. But whenever we do this, we are lying to ourselves and being unfair because there is no one righteous, not one. It is only God who is deserving to be called hero. It is truly God's will that we should seek rather than any person's. With that in mind, would you pray with me? God, we come before you admitting that we are selfish and we are small-minded and we're unable to have the right perspective. But God, you are the one who is willing to be involved in our conflicts and in our mess. So God, would you come and speak to us in the midst of our conflict and help us to hear your voice and follow your will 
so that we can submit where we're supposed to submit and experience your kindness so that we can say, because of you, we experience true peace. All these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen.